Herzlich willkommen bei Bite am Limit, liebe Wallinauten. Schön, dass ihr wieder dabei seid zu mehr Spaß im Glas. So, heute mal ein bisschen ungewohnt. Wenn ihr euch fragt, was ich hier mache, Sebastian und ich sind on Tour. Moin. Bitte? Moin, sag ich. Ach so, sagst du Moin, ja. Also, Leute. Wir holen jetzt gerade eine der berühmtesten Weinpersönlichkeiten der Welt ab. Er ist, einer, er ist der erfolgreichste Verleger in Sachen Wein. Er ist einer der ersten Journalisten. Eigentlich muss man sagen, unser gesamtes Geschäft hat ihm unglaublich viel zu verdanken. Die meisten wissen wahrscheinlich schon, um wen es sich handelt. Es ist Hugh Johnson, Master of Wine, Order of the British Empire, eine, ja, eine Persönlichkeit, ein Elder Statesman, Herausgeber von vielen Büchern und unter anderem Deswegen ist heute in Hamburg dieses Buch. Das ist das meistverlegte Buch überhaupt, was es in Sachen Wein gibt. 13 Millionen Mal, 17. Auflage, gibt es seit den 70er Jahren. Der kleine Johnson, so machen wir jetzt ein bisschen Bucke aus hier. Also der kleine Johnson 2017, ähm, ich fand es schön. Ich habe viel drin gelesen über sehr interessante Betriebe, neue Betriebe, ist viel Neues drin. Aber eben, und das, da ist der Johnson ziemlich stark drin und auch natürlich auch seine ganzen... Journalisten und alle Leute, die für ihn arbeiten, seine Contributors, äh, viele kleine interessante Geschichten über diese ganzen Veränderungen. Und ich möchte mit ihm gleich so in den nächsten anderthalb Stunden, wir schneiden es zusammen, ähm, mich ein bisschen unterhalten über die Veränderungen in der Weinbranche, was ist passiert in den letzten Jahrzehnten, was kommt, wohin wird es gehen. Wir werden auch ein paar Weine verkosten, also ich nicht, aber Hugh und ähm, Sebastian, bist fit? Ja, Ton läuft. Ton läuft. Also da würde ich sagen, fahren wir jetzt mal zum Hotel Atlantik. Wir fahren mit Hugh nachher mal durch die Stadt. Ich wollte ihm bei dem schönen Wetter mal ein bisschen Hamburg zeigen. Und äh, ja, das ist, glaube ich, eine spannende Sendung. In dem Sinn, bis gleich. Herzlich willkommen bei Wein am Limit. Da ist er. Das ist Hugh Johnson. Er ist eine Legende. Er ist äh, Master of Wine. Er ist äh, Träger OBE. You are Order of the British Empire as well, Hugh. I am Order, but not just for wine. I, I have a double citation. Yep. It is for my contribution to winemaking and horticulture. Yeah, that's what I told everyone horticulture, when, yeah. when I was driving to here, that your second life sometimes yeah. is also to us people in the wine business, almost unknown. Mm. So, uh, well, so uh, gardeners say, what, what do you have to do with wine? And wine people say, <laughs> what do you have to do with gardening? So that's fine. So what I'm intending to do now, I, you said you've been to Hamburg a couple of times, but I give you now yeah. a private tour of Hamburg and we drive to some scenic spots. And yeah. uh, so we can talk about your book, about Absolutely. wine, about life. You probably know all the good bars too. Well, we can go later on, we can go to a very nice wine bar as well. <laughs> okay, that's a lovely day today. You know, it had, yeah, it was very warm in Munich, very, very warm. Ham Hamburg, it rains a lot in Hamburg, uh, and when the sun's shining, it can be the most beautiful city of Germany, some people say. Yeah. Well, it's certainly green. Yeah. Very, very green. So, um, do, do you live in London, or do you yes, live we, we outside moved, London? Yes, we moved house to London four years ago. Mm -hmm. We lived in the country, we lived in the same house in the country for 42 years. Um, and it was a big deal, moving, but it was a good idea. So we had, I used to have a marvelous cellar in, in the country, big cellar. Well, uh, you, you have a big cellar in the country? How I, many, I how had many a, bottles? Do you know, I never counted the bottles. Ah. There were five rooms. Okay. Um, and So you have a lot I, of friends? Uh, not enough <laughs> to get through it. That was, <laughs> that's the problem with wine. You, have, you buy beautiful wines and your friends are not particularly bothered, you know, as long yeah. as they get plenty to drink. And the last thing they want to discuss, discuss is vintages. Of, uh, so it can be frustrating. And, yeah. and, and that is why uh, wine auctions are such a success, I think, or why they were in the first place. Mm -hmm. Because uh, it was the second-hand wine market. You know, you bought this lovely mm -hmm. wine. Your friends didn't even acknowledge it or know what it was. They said, oh, thank you, Hugh. This is a very nice bottle of wine. And started talking about the football again. And so what was the point? And I'm afraid this is a sad fact that uh, great wines are probably mostly drunk by people who don't know what they're drinking. Do you agree? <laughs> I, I, I would agree to a certain extent. I mean, I, I don't bother either if they don't know exactly what it is, as long as they can appreciate. But you're right, uh, many people don't. Is it, is it okay for you? No, that's right, yeah. just a little less direct. Yeah. 
No, but uh, I think many people have big cellars and they don't, they didn't think in first place who they're going to drink it with. Well, that's exactly right. That's what we all do when we're younger. And when you get, when you get older, uh, you begin to look at the values and you think, but it would be, mm. my God, this is worth, mm. you know, a hundred pounds a glass. Mm. And then you could be quite embarrassed to serve it to friends because yeah. they would say, well, what is he, you know, what, what does he want from me? I mean, why is he giving me something this valuable? Well, one thing is the invitation, and then if they invite you back, they feel obliged to give and you then, a, a, an equal wine or something. And then they spend a long time apologizing, you know, this isn't your style of wine. And I find that to be quite boring, you know, I'd rather talk about something um, we're here more at, sympathetic. Okay, we're here at the, really in the city center of Hamburg. Um, the river is over there, the dam. Yeah. There is the Hotel Four Seasons, which is another lovely hotel. And this is called oh, yes. Jungfernstieg. Yep. So this is like basically, if you have a fast car, not like us, like the not, Porsche over I'm there. I'm sure then not as fast as this. You can show your car. You can show oh, your Oh, you bag. can drive up and down showing exactly. your badge. Yes, yes. Yeah. But uh, it is a really nice place. Rather so like, we went, once went to um, Modena. Modena in Italy. Modena. And nobody told us that there is a passeggiata of cars in the evening. Yeah. And everybody gets, they collect not just, um, what is it, they make Ferraris or is it Maseratis? Anyway, they're, Ferraris they're, most likely, huh? uh, yeah. In, uh, so people have these collections on them and they will drive around in the most valuable vintage Ferrari. But they also collect Bugattis and everything else. So this Passeggiata is quite something to watch. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Do you still travel a lot into into the wine regions or to promote well, at one uh, time I was full uh, time. You know, I was traveling mm -hmm. when I was doing the Weltweinatlas and all that. Mm -hmm. I had to travel everywhere. But no, I mean now that I'm, I'm certainly not retired. But on the other hand, I'm able to pick and choose a bit, mm -hmm. and I don't like sitting in aircraft for 14 hours. Mm -hmm. So I haven't been to Australia for a while. Um, well, I, you know, I was in California in the spring. I go back to New York uh, in the week after next. Mm. Oh dear, what's happened here? Uh, oh, this was um, this is a publisher's house called Axel Springer. Um, no. Bild Zeitung is like the the Sun. Yes. And um, yeah, they're tearing it. Parts of it, they're tearing it down now. If Springer's in trouble, we're all in trouble. No, but Spr <laughs> Springer, Springer is now moving to Berlin, and uh, oh, really? of course, like I mean, from Hamburg, a lot of people don't know but the distance from here to um, to Hamburg by train is less than well it's about two hours so it's really close to, to where to Berlin, to Berlin yeah so, so many of those two hours, can you? many of those companies they oh, well, we let them go here uh, many of those companies and uh, publishing houses went to uh, to Berlin oh, because I it's see. The, the capital yeah yeah uh, so that's what happens so uh, Ganske is based here. It's not the biggest. Uh, most Ganske is the uh, Jahreszeit Verlag, which is another part of town. All right. So this yeah, is Spr yeah. Springer. This is like. Yeah, but they are big, 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 big national. So is, is, there, is there built their paper? Pardon me. Is the, the, the built. The, the Bildzeitung, exactly. Bild yes. Zeitung, is do, it? Do yeah. you have you read it? Uh, not really. No. <laughs> <laughs> Well, a lot of, lot of people, you know, it's like, it's a paper nobody talks about, nobody has read it, but everybody knows what's in it. <laughs> like our Daily Mail in London, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So what part of the town are we in? We're now? still in the center here, and we're yeah. now going uh, through towards the harbor. Here you can see, um, this oh, is yeah. like the uh, Alster going towards the river. Oh, I see. right. And the big church here? Uh, that's St. Nikolai. Yeah. That's uh, one of the churches of Hamburg. Mm -hmm. ah. One of the tall ones. Well, we have the, 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 the sign of Hamburg, the, uh, the most prominent one is the Michel. Ah, we, right. uh, we pass by later on. Yeah, great. That's the cathedral, is it? Uh, yeah. Wow, yeah. It's a, well, it's a beautiful church, really. I think it was built by an Italian. It's mm. good that you ask me all these questions. I'm yeah, <laughs> not really sure. <laughs> I, I wanted to talk to, uh, to you about, uh, with you about wine, and I think... I had um, guessed that you had an ulterior motive intention. in asking me for a drive, yes. And my intention really was like to find out a little bit, because uh, I think the first wine book I ever got, uh, I ever received, was the Hugh Johnson. It was this book. 
I think well, for, I guess for many people that's the Kleine Pocket Guides. Yeah, I think, well, over the last 40 years. But, um, when did you so start it? 77. This is number 40. Yeah. Uh, I can't believe that I've been doing this for 40 years running, but it just, um, it's become habitual, really. A certain time of year, I sit down and get on with it. Mm -hmm. I, I, I read that it is the most sold wine publication ever. 13 million copies. Uh, That's what I read. We, we, know, we know about 12 million copies. I won't okay. go further Odd than well. that. And, um, well, it, it would be the most sold if it's been selling for 40 years, wouldn't yeah. it? No, it used to sell in very, very large numbers, like hundreds of thousands. Mm -hmm. Now it's... Um, Still, you know, it's well into uh, six figures, but it's not like it used to be when we sold millions. But I think I think it also attracts people, and I think um, that's where you come from. You're, you're also a journalist that you could see what people wanted. Uh, they right. wanted to have a, a quick impression on. Yeah, exactly. Well, the, 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 I'll tell you how it started. Um, it started when, after I'd done the World Atlas of Wine, which was the big, if you like, coffee table wine book for the first one that was a real success, and it really, it sold unbelievable numbers. I, but you wouldn't believe it, we're up to four million with that book, and it's expensive. Mm -hmm. So there's a huge public for wine stuff, or there was, I don't know. Mm -hmm. So my publisher then was with us in the kitchen one day, and he said, do you know, Hugh, all that anyone really needs to know about wine, we could put in a little book like this, and he produced his pocket diary. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you're right, you're absolutely right. But if I really crunch it tight, pack it tight, mm -hmm. I can give the essentials in a little book. Mm -hmm. And so I sat down and I wrote it. And the first edition, which was the 1977 edition, I didn't even research anything. I just sat down and wrote out all the nam names I could remember, <laughs> you know, and it was very popular. Well, well I, I, I guess it would have oh, it was been tiny. much thicker in 100, those days. It was 140 pages or 100, yeah. something like that. Uh, and then, of course, a year later, James, my publisher, said, OK, and uh, we need the revision. And I said, the revision? Oh, my God, I've got to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> and of course, the second time around, I had to do much more research. And, and, um, but since then, every year, and I didn't realize that I had hit on the one reference subject in existence which actually has built in obsolescence. Mm -hmm. You actually do need to get a new book mm -hmm. because there's a new vintage mm -hmm. and everything in the wine yeah. world changes so quickly. Dynamic. Uh, it is. I mean, I would really think, what other book could you need to sell every year? Maybe in the old days it would be a railway timetable or something, yeah, yeah. but there's nothing else that needs updating. Maybe cars. Maybe cars. But you don't need a whole reference book. No, every, not really. Not every car in the world. Tell me how it was in those days. I mean, in the 70s, people, when I, I sometimes hear horror stories in, in terms of that the wine world was still very classy and was... You know, maybe just very few people had the good wines, and maybe yeah, was but it liberal or was it very strict and severe? I suppose you'd say it was strict and severe. Um, but there was a very wise remark made by I can't remember who. Who? Oh yes, a California friend said this to me. He said, "50 you no, in the old days, uh, wine was for the worthy." Now it's for the wealthy. Now, if you think about that, that's exactly the change that's happened. Mm. People who were interested and sort of intended to be intellectuals, mm. doctors, lawyers, really educated people like that, they studied wine mm. and they worked at studying it to some degree. They shared it with friends who had done the same sort of thing. And uh, okay, you could call them, they were worthy of great wine. Now all you have to do to get into great wine is sign a massive great check. <laughs> we, we've told people how to find great wine, well now all, all they have to do is buy it. It was more interesting when you had to find it. This comes now here, here we're in a very beautiful uh, part this of the, the Schweigerstadt. Well. So this is yeah. basically 
where they kept all the. That's because the Hamburger called Pfeffersäcke. Yeah. Because they were. Uh, oh, yes. Bunches full of uh, uh, poivre, uh, pepper. Oh, and right. so they kept it here the tobacco and the wine and everything. So yes, this so was a free trading zone. The trade with the East Indies. And, yeah. Exactly. And uh, they have, um, I guess it's the same in London, you have the Canary Wharf, I think. Oh, that's Canary Wharf, yeah, yeah. Well, that's a modern, that's a completely modern yeah. business district. That didn't exist before. Yeah. But they have added another part in the, in the back over there. The oh, so yeah, yeah. Oh, I must see that. Yeah. Just be right behind those towers. Dock um, four. We, we can, yeah. We go over there, take a left over there. Oh, and I can show you the is, symphony. This is marvelous, these old warehouses. It's beautiful, huh? Yes, mm. there. Especially when yeah. the sun is out, it's a really nice place. And of course the goods in these were so valuable, they had to protect them with armed guards. And yeah. 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 Yeah, it still was until the 90s that you could not go into this part of town. Really? Uh, as it was a free trading zone, oh, so it was protected. But wasn't it all bombed in the Second World War? Uh, most parts of well, yeah. Hamburg, Hamburg really got heavily destroyed. But the docks in particular. But uh, there, there is the symphony. Ah, uh, yes. Well, not bad, yeah. don't you yeah. think? Yeah. Cost yeah. a little bit more than expected, but who cares? But they still haven't got an orchestra. <laughs> well, I, I, I think they're uh, assembling it at the moment. <laughs> but <laughs> well, we, you always hear, you read constant yeah. stories in the paper, so you basically I, I, I lost a little bit the interest. But now, um, I guess we are now one year from uh, oh, right, finishing. Really. I guess it becomes no more evident. That, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, this is like our showcase now. Yeah. Oh, that's rather amazing. Yeah. And here you can see they have all the... Oh, uh, like, like Sydney, I mean, on the water. It looks a little bit like it. Yeah. Huh? And it's here you can see district. it's all new. Yeah, it attracts, at the moment, it attracts a lot of people. Um, oh yeah, it's very special. For, let's say, tourists who come to Hamburg and uh, yeah. so many activities going on here. Do people travel by water at all in Hamburg? Are yeah. the water buses? Yeah, yeah. Not, not, not heavily like maybe in, in other cities like yeah. I've seen in San Francisco, for example, but, but still, mm. no, no, it's, it works. A lot of people live on the south side. And, and commute. Yeah, yeah. And then they commute, exactly. Yeah. But of course, you know, we Germans are into cars, so um, we won't give up on that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, if I had the opportunity of going by water instead of by road, that's what I'd do. <laughs> yeah. So we're going now to see a friend in the restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, he's a young sommelier uh -huh. and he's eager, of course, to, to meet you. And uh, he was going to ask you some questions. So his name is Jonathan and yeah. the restaurant called Bullerei. Mm -hmm. Do you know Jamie Oliver, the, the chef? In the well, I know who you mean, yeah. actually, because my daughter worked with him. Oh. She's, a, All right. she's a television presenter about wine, and uh, okay. she used to do, you know, he did the food and she did the wine. And the owner of the Bullerei is Tim Melzer, so he basically is the equal to maybe Jamie Oliver. Oh, I see, right. So, um, what I think is really lovely in that spot that they really care about wine. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that's where I'm from the restaurant business. When I go sometimes to restaurants and I see they don't care for, for wine, I feel almost yeah. like, um, how to say, frustrated or uh, well, shall sure, I say? Yeah. But do you, uh, you used to be at uh, Julio Jacob, no? Yes, I used to work in the Hotel Did Jacob. Exactly. You were the familiar there? Yes. Yeah, that's what I remember, yeah. And, uh, and then you went off on to do your own thing. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that the only thing is like, I, I worked there for 13 years and I no, you're kidding. thought for that. myself another seven and then I worked 20 years in the same place and it was at the age yeah. of 40 when it hit me. Yeah. And I said, I want to do something again or something, how to say, uh, to update myself. Yeah. And this is how I ended up now being a wine importer and um, having my little video blog and show here. Right. And it makes a lot no, of, I've it's so much fun. The world is changing. Oh yeah. Does it, does it affect the books uh, with, uh, do you think, does it, the, with um, books and online, is that the problem? Well, it depends what books, to be honest. I mean, people still love physical books. Yeah, books make a wonderful gift. Mm. You know, maybe more books are bought as gifts than for the person who buys them, I don't know. But um, I the, think there's a renaissance. 
with books. They're, they're going. Small one. They're going well. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're going well. Um, although there are, I mean, Amazon is a problem to publishers. Mm -hmm. You know, Amazon steals all the profit, mm -hmm. as it does with a lot of businesses, like in the wine. Wine now they're starting yeah, with wine as starting. well. Yeah. Well, we have to somehow fight that. Mm. Very difficult. It's hard. I think people have well, what we can do from our side just to show that we care and have passion and that we give the best, better service than they do. But a lot of people, I guess, must be the same in England. They yeah. just look for the price when it comes down to the bottom line. Oh, yeah. And then they yeah. lose the fun of it. Everything is yeah. about money. It's not about the, well, the joy of the product. Yeah, I do feel that you know, quite strongly in Germany, funnily enough. That uh, people just hear the price of something and say, "No, nobody will be interested in that." Rather than, "Why is it that expensive? Is it, you know, is it that special? I want to try it." <laughs> That's uh, when you in restaurants nowadays with the iPhone. Yeah. A lot of people go on the apps and check the prices, but they don't know if the wine is available, if it's a vintage. Yeah. And then I don't. I think they are sometimes not really smart when they. When they buy the wine there, because um, how to say they might have to pay extra for the shipment, and so they say yeah. to the restaurant, "Oh, your wine is only 10 euros. Oh, yeah. Now you're selling it to me for 40 or something." Yeah, well, restaurant markups have always been. A, they can be crazy. You know, you know it's just <laughs> a sore point for many of us. Yeah, but if Amazon came to you and said, "Henrik, can we buy your show?" Will, will you bring your show to Amazon and sell wine for us? You, you would think very hard about it. You know, <laughs> of course, powerful. money is tempting. Um, ah, yeah. that's, uh, that's for sure, you're right. On, on the other hand, uh, I don't think that they ever think of selling and promoting wine like this because I think they're much more into price. But we never know what they're up to. Oh, I think they might do some window dressing, you know, with, um, mm. with a special selection. Thomas selects Amazon. No, but but you know, for Wine am Limit, for example, it's we have really small scale wines. And actually, we yeah. can, I can show you a couple of wines we've brought. I wanted to present them to you and uh, ask you about your opinion. Uh -huh. We don't have to drink them now. We still have a lot of drinks tonight, so um, I'm not sure if yeah. you're in the mood for drinking. Well, maybe not right now, <laughs> and maybe just yet. But we're going. You say we're going to go to a wine bar or restaurant. To a wine bar, or exactly. Or Give me my eine, eine von den Flaschen. You brought also some wines, which I have here. Oh my God. Well, this That's is the, the that, first that wine. That is a noise that your viewers love to hear. This is a Riesling from Germany, and I think which you chose and which we tasted yesterday in Munich. Did you ta have you tasted it yet? Yeah, yeah, we put it in the lineup. What, what, what do you, what do you think about it? I thought this it was the... absolutely lovely wine. I really did. I thought it was a very, very good example of the new trend uh, Riesling Trocken. Mm -hmm. I really like. It. I mean, we hardly see those in in Britain. And, you know, they haven't caught on yet. It's the importers but though, which don't have enough confidence. What do you think? Yeah, they don't have the confidence. There's no demand. And as you're probably aware, that German wine got such a bad name in Britain mm. um, because, well, there was this sort of chasing the bottom of the market. Mm. I mean, for a long time, it was just extraordinary. Germany was apparently happy to sell the cheapest wine in Europe. Mm -hmm. With, you know, and considering German standard of living and so on, it was absolutely ridiculous. But it did an enormous amount of harm to German wine. So people in Britain still think German wine is cheap or should be cheap. Mm. And they expect it to be sweet and watery. And um, still, there still is going on. I mean, oh. like if you if you look now at the the whole the young German vintners and let's say the whole movement in the last yeah. last twenty years. And, and you've been a big supporter of it, well, with uh, Jensen Robinson and others. Uh, you've been a big supporter for German wine. We have been pushing German Riesling, I have, for half a century. And uh, without the greatest success, I have to say, you know, we haven't started a great trend for it. And that's something I just don't understand. I mean, to me, it's self evidently a uh, superb wine. Uh, it has qualities that you're not going to find in a New Zealand Sauvignon Blanc, mm. which everybody, you know, those the standard drinks in Britain, standard wines are P 
Pinot Grigio from north of Italy mm. and Sauvignon Blanc from, from Marlborough. From Marlborough. Yeah. Uh, and they all taste like uh, the green grass of Marlborough. Yes, I mean, Most of them, not all yeah. of them. Well, I think they are so boring, so predictable. <laughs> but, you know, predictable people like. Mm. They want to pull, take the screw cap off and know exactly what they're going to get. Whereas I say, well, the, the joy of wine is that I don't know exactly what I'm going to get. Because mm. a different vintage, different producer, I'm going to get a surprise. Mm. Uh, people don't like buying surprises. It's a shame. That's an interesting fact. What you? Uh, I just posted this on Facebook, and I mm. said, boring people drink boring wines, and mm. they always look for wines which they know, so they are not into yeah. open-minded, and they're not how to say it, they don't have the guts to just experience and to, to yeah. reflect and to judge for themselves. Yeah. But this is leads to another topic, which is yeah. people buy second-hand opinion. Yeah. Why did everybody follow Robert Parker? Yeah. Because he was confident and he gave wine scores. Uh, and uh, they said, well, I don't have to bother to judge for myself. It's been done for me. But I think it's humiliating to buy your opinion second hand. Surely we should, grown ups should have their own opinion. I, I for myself, I have, there's two things in my heart about Parker. One thing is I have um, met and experienced a lot of good, great wines. Uh, the, the other thing is that this whole trade uh, only knew him at one point and basically everybody gave his brain to someone else and say yeah. do this for me and uh, I thought like we have lost this kind of responsibility this yeah. kind of well, that's sense. The that's the point I'm making yeah mm. Mm. And, uh, and of course that had the knock-on effect on the style of wine that producers were producing so they, they made it to please his very obvious palate mm. and We're still, oh my God. Ay, 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 ay. Little girl, well, she was, well. Well, she may have been in the right, but it was dangerous. She was right. Um, what was I saying? That, well, we, uh, were, um, no. we were about Parker and the yeah. world. Giving up your own taste. Yeah. But also the effect it had on producers. Yeah. Uh, which we still see, I mean, the bigger the better is still mm. what a lot of people think. Mm. Um, I never understand why, I mean, apart from aiming to get high Parker points, why producers want to produce wines where you need so little and you want so little, where one glass is enough? Mm. I mean, if I were a wine producer, I'd think it was stupid to produce one glass wines. I, the whole point would be to produce a wine where people order a second bottle. Yeah. In other words, it hasn't got to be too huge. No, it's coming back, this kind of movement. I can tell you, in the restaurant business, I see this more and more, of, especially the young sommeliers, I think they, they have, how to say, they maybe learn from the mistakes of the generations yeah. before. They might have even have been reading the sermons that I preach all the time about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, I, oh no, and uh, I, I think a lot of things are going back to the classics. <coughs> yeah. Like, like you have been um, a classic guy in terms of when, when you invented basically the wine scene. You were one of the first, really, to uh, to explore and to 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 liberate. Basically, you're a liberator as well, because I think yeah, I maybe mean, in Britain at that time, wine was only for the upper class. Yes, it will. Yeah, well, I was saying it was for mm. people of. Um, academically inclined people, people who are mm. accustomed to studying and, and uh, if other people couldn't be bothered, well, bad luck to them. No, I mean, you, you, like every subject, the more you put into it, the more you can take out of it. Mm. So, put a bit of effort into choosing your wine, as you do, and you are rewarded. Well, what I like about this, another thing I th in, in many chapters in your book, I found lovely little stories. Um, and uh, one is about, you are writing about, how to say things are now changing in terms of where you grow your wines, that the world is changing um, oh, yeah. climatically. Um, Owen, for example, where the Riesling from Marcus, mm -hmm. which I just showed you yeah. what you had last night. It's from the highest vineyards of the Nile. Yeah. And the Nile didn't exist until the 70s, really. It wasn't the wine area. Yeah. And 
Um, his parents basically gave almost up on the wines in the 80s because it was too cold. Oh, so the, the family has had vines for a long time. Yeah, so. yeah. But uh, so it had it had to be really the son to come back and to um, say. Well, it's interesting you say that because one of the main points that uh, when people say to me, "What has changed? Why have things got better?" And I say, "We've got a new generation. You know, old people just used to make wine that gra the, the, the way that grand granddad made it, mm -hmm. uh, and that was the correct way to make wine." Mm -hmm. But uh, their children have been to college. Uh, they've learned more. They've mm -hmm. met other growers' children. They, I mean, in the old days, people didn't even discuss what they were doing. It was like it was a secret. You know, mm -hmm. we make our wine that way. We don't want anyone else to know how we make it. Well, you can't live like that anymore. No. Uh, th though I think a lot of these big, large producers, they have no soul. They have. How to say, sometimes I think they have lost it either, because oh, yeah. they're in the hands of someone else, so they don't live their own life anymore. Oh, so yeah. I'm, I'm sure but what's better, really. Well, there's industrial production of everything, and wine is not an exception. Is mm. it? You know, who's going to sell all the, supply all the supermarkets? Yeah, mm. and, and fair enough, I think uh, at least there's, you know, a, I think supermarket wines on a glance have gotten much better than in the past. Yeah. That's but when to... I don't know if you remember when f supermarkets first sold wine. It's a long time ago now. It's say only it's about thirty years ago. Yeah. Oh, well, I wasn't time. drinking wine. No, I know. It just started. I know, but but, <laughs> but but what people don't realize is that that was the biggest revolution of all, when for the first time there was wine alongside groceries. Yeah. And going shopping meant going to a wine store. Yeah. That was revolutionary. Oh, I can imagine. Otherwise, you had to go to a special store. And yeah. And that, that was already like um, kind of a difficulty, I guess, to go there. Well, people did, did, didn't bother. Yeah. They weren't confronted with wine when they went shopping. Yeah. We have another wine also, which, which you brought and which I, I, I'm quite keen, which I'm going to taste this tonight, uh, which shows also the revolution in your country mm -hmm. in terms of what has happened. Nicht in Türkei, den Sparkling. Ah, yes. yes. Now you're going to talk about my favorite subject. Yeah. <laughs> well, it took us a while, you know. So this is the wine Balfour. It's quality uh, sparkling wine, product of England, 1503. I guess that's when they started. That is not the vintage. <laughs> no, not the oldest. <laughs> that will be the oldest then. <laughs> Probably available. No, I think it's a rather funny name. But um, in fact, it's, the, it's the, the date when this guy's house was built. Uh, but um, ah, okay. it, it, this is a marvelous wine. I'm so glad you found this one because to me it is a really good example of how the English um, sparkling cuvées have, have graduated. You know, they've come come of age. They, that is a lovely wine. And balance, freshness, pure flavors. When, it's, when did it's, they when did they start? I think in the 60s and the 70s. Nobody no, talked about English wine or no, no, or English sparkling wine. Those vines were probably planted in. The late 80s, something yeah. like that. Uh, the first one. You know what is the funny so, so thing? A lot of people always ask me about ask me about England. A lot of people always ask me what, what's happening there, and I think now it's a thousand hectares. So a lot of people are curious. It's like with yeah. China, this great myth. Oh, oh what, a, what about China? It's at least two thousand hectares. I mean, it's growing very rapidly, and now because two of the big champagne houses have bought vineyards in England. That convinces everybody it must be uh, serious. So there must be something behind the scene. There must be. Well, they've only got to taste the wine to see. El Dorado. It. <laughs> yeah. So, let's see if he's there. Yeah, what is we're it? gonna we're gonna just uh, pick him up and then we continue yeah. driving to another yeah, well. place. So, Jonathan, but, uh, how are you today? Uh, I'm fine. Yeah. Jonathan is the, is the sommelier I was mentioned. Oh, yeah. it works in yes, you were. We, Henrik was yeah. introducing you to me as we drove. Oh, okay. But I think the interesting concept you have here is that drinking and driving go together. Uh, it will surprise a lot of people. <laughs> Not really, I can tell you, and I, I, I dare you to do so. It is a 0 0.5. Um, per mil, which, yes. which is not a lot, um, and uh, even on a bicycle you have to be careful. 
The yeah. only thing is, what we are allowed to, we are allowed to have a bottle of wine in the car, but it has to be closed. It, but it, you're allowed it, yeah. to drink beer as long as you're not driving. You are allowed to drink beer. Yeah, you're and not allowed to drive, drive drunk, but you're allowed to drive drinking. I oh really? Yeah. I never I knew that. that. I, I never you done it. Do. You shouldn't. <laughs> maybe in Bavaria. In Bavaria, maybe. In Bavaria, yeah. Perhaps it's. At home, you can do. It's probably compulsory in Bavaria to carry beer, you know. <laughs> it's compulsory. <laughs> Any time. Yes. Well, you got me confused. I have no idea which way is which now. Have you been to Hamburg <laughs> before? Oh, yeah. yeah. But I uh, hadn't explored the interesting little bits like this. Okay. Now, this is like, this part wasn't the nicest part for many years, and now it's like the. Yeah. How to say, like, what, what, in London there must be, like must be places like this. Oh, yeah. many, 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 yeah. What's the name? Um, what Smithfield the... Market, maybe. Uh, yeah. Things like this. Are you sure we can buy from here? I am not sure. That's because Wittenwald is over there. So it's really a little further. Fresh. It's at the, the corner. So ah, yes, you're right. Okay, yeah. Okay, good. We can mm. leave the car over here. Over right here. We need to deliver some wine anyway, so, um, yeah. Jonathan, do you have a question for you? Something you wanted to know? I guess you, you must have read Hugh, Hugh Johnson's books. I have uh, so yes, I read quite a few. <laughs> I did quite a few, yeah. Um, I don't know questions in mind. Well, perhaps I, I make everything clear in my books. <laughs> yeah. There are nothing There's to be nothing, added. Nothing left to ask. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, what I'm missing once in a while is uh, like natural wines or orange wines, which are. Are you are you keen on them? Yes, you that are. Would be interesting. I really, I really am. And I'm uh -huh. interested in your opinion on that. Well, there are some good ones, undoubtedly, but there's so much rubbish. Yes. Uh, I, you know, I've, I've got a curiosity if I see one on the list. Yeah. Certainly, if it is by the glass, I'll always try it. Okay. And uh, I have had some disgusting things like that. You know, wines that were fermenting and were dirty. Thick. Yeah. I don't. I mean, it seems to me we've we've got further in winemaking than that. Why go backwards? But you would tell me why. So you think it's just mm -hmm. fashion, or you think? It's yeah, it's just fashion. It's experimental. I mean, mm -hmm. you've got a lot of young people coming into wine who say, "Well, I'm not just going to do what other people have done. Okay. I want to try something of my own ideas." But then. Um, they could be quite reluctant to admit that it's a failure. It just didn't work. You know, they bottle it anyway. Now you try it, and I'll make you confident because I'll charge you a lot of money. So it must be good. Uh, whereas they really should have admitted that it was a failure. Yeah, and drunk it themselves. Uh, <laughs> well, there is, but there is so-called natural wines which which have been making Emilio Pepe, for example in the Abruzzen, Valentini. Oh, um, no, I'm not saying, I, I just did say mm. there are very, very good ones, mm. but unfortunately their name is spoilt by the being bad ones, mm. uh, which are sometimes so expensive that people will say, well, it must be good because it's mm. expensive. You know, you can fool people like that, and that's a shame. I think they need a quality control. <laughs> I think the best explanation is what you said, there is good ones, as there is bad mm. ones in, with, uh, let's say, conventional wines. Uh, I, I taste a lot of wines, maybe they don't have any faults, but they're boring. But they're boring. Yeah. No so boring what's, what's the other, that's the other way, I mean. Well, which would you rather have, boring or disgusting? <laughs> uh, rather both, I, I, I try <laughs> to avoid. <laughs> well, sometimes it's a choice. And yeah. But it's, it's almost like you have a choice between. Uh, uh, it's fine. What's after? You have to. You have the choice between uh, the electric chair or the uh, the guillotine. <laughs> I would uh, have to say between Schneider and Weiler. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So let's go for a drink. We come back and. Uh, oh, we've uh, arrived. Have we? Is this? Uh, no, it's uh, just behind us. Um, actually, we have some. Uh, we have some other wines in the back. Kannst du mal einen von den rausholen? Vielleicht den uh, Busaco habe ich gedacht. That's a wine I'm, I'm really keen on your opinion about. 
Oh, that's an old Usako Bronco, because... That's an old friend. I've known that all my life. I read this in your yeah. book that if you go to Portugal, you should go here. Yeah, and did you go? I, I went, went. yes. I went and it was... Uh, it, it's a joy. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful I love this place. one here. It is staggering. Uh, Oh my god, well, how did you find it? This? I this import, is... import this one. Just... No kidding. Whoa, this is so cool. I wanted to show this at the tasting. Oh really? Oh, we should have done that. How do you know, Peter? Uh, many years. Not not many as you, but uh, now for 10 years at least. And um, I'm a really big fan of his wines it's in Sicily. And I think you just wrote an, arti wrote an article. In, in Decanter, yeah. Yeah. About how I discovered that he was there. Um, isn't that extraordinary? And you do you have um, Vina, uh, Vina Grande? Vina Grande? Yes, of you course. Do? Yeah, oh yeah. my God! But well, we import it all. It's uh, we we don't get a lot. Oh, no. It doesn't make a lot, obviously. No, no, no. But I thought like maybe this is interesting because in your in your book you if, find if, all these if new I'd stories. If I'd known that this was here in Hamburg, I would, <laughs> I, I would have chosen it. Yeah. But it's too late now. It's Eisma Grande. This is this is Monte Carubo. It's from Sicily. What can you tell us about this wine and what about your friendship to uh, Peter? Well, Peter Vinding Diaz is maybe my oldest wine friend. Um, I met him in Bordeaux. Uh, what? 45 years ago, something like that. And I've always thought that he was one of the most intelligent winemakers, mm -hmm. although he is a very independent soul. You know, he doesn't necessarily fit in to very, very many um, scenarios. Mm -hmm. uh, but he's always moving on. You know, he starts some great thing and then he moves on. Mm -hmm. Anyway, he and I started the Royal Tokai Wine Company together. And um, we started making the best Tokai that had been made for, well, since before the Second World War, anyway. Uh, but pleasure. he got so impatient. We became, ah, Lord, we really got all the problems. Royal Tokai! This is, is this your winery, by actually? Or it is my vineyard. It's your vineyard. The Mesa's is, okay. is my vineyard, and it's historically, it's, um, it's one of the oldest, best known vineyards in the region. It's very small. What do you like about Tokai? What's well, what a strange the, question. Well, I mean. because, uh, what, yeah, well, maybe a lot of people have never experienced Tokai, I guess. Well, no, that's the nature of Tokai. Yeah. You know, it is the most undemocratic wine in the world. Mm -hmm. Nobody except royal people tasted Tokai yeah. for the first 200 years of its existence. You know, it was the wine of the, uh, of, of the King of Hungary, the Emperor of Austria, the Tsar of Russia. And that was it. Um, so it was a real rarity. And if people ever tasted it, they were blown away, but they'd never find it again, probably. The best tasting note about Tokai that ever was, was um, somebody in a diary, he wrote, I just tasted um, Imperial Tokai, of course. And it is so unlike any other wine I ever tasted. It was like seeing a new primary color. Mm -hmm. and I think that's one of the greatest tasting notes of all time. <laughs> Can you imagine a new primary color? Anyways, it is, it is that mm -hmm. original. So, uh, and it, it delivers such intense experience mm -hmm. in such a gentle way. Ah, oh, we've come back to your home. Yeah, we, we drop him off, he has to work now, and we are going yeah. also to work for the uh, tasting tonight. But, but so, it's almost like, it sounds like you, when you experience wine, you talk like an artist, or you talk like someone who likes art. It's like a Well, I'm a, special I'm a writer, piece. you know, it's my, my business. Is so, then lassen wir dich mal hier wieder raus. Yeah. I, I think it was a very good question about natural wines, and I think you, think you did a good job of answering nice it. <laughs> oh, I'm Sorry not to see more of you, but you can see, you can see the I back can see of my head. You. you can see the Jonathan. back of my head. I just got the Kulumela out of the bag. Guten Service, yeah. genau. Nimm dein Wein noch mit. Yeah. Ja. Nicht, dass du noch dich die Gäste verdursten. Oh, he's, a, he's a nice, very nice young man, I yeah. think. You know, it's nice now. Some, no, sommeliers have changed as well. He's a sommelier too. He's a sommelier, yes. Oh, right. But think of in the uh, old times. An apron and a tuxedo, or a oh, I like it when they do. <laughs> well, it's also, I mean, there's nothing wrong with classics, I think, though it's nice to see that yeah. 
That's also I think people. chefs should wear tall white hats. Okay. Um, and uh, we should know which is the sommelier because he's got an apron. He doesn't need to wear a bunch of keys. Like, <laughs> or, or the, um, the yeah. Tustava. Yeah. Looks tustava. like an ashtray, doesn't it? Yeah, it is an ashtray. Yeah. <laughs> For cigars. Uh, um, <laughs> Well, you confused me completely. I Sorry. I don't know any idea. I don't have any <laughs> idea what city I'm in. This is uh, Hamburg, I suppose. <laughs> well, some people say Hamburg is a suburb of London in terms of the, the really? feeling. And when it rains in London, that people will um, put up their, put up their umbrella. <laughs> well, no, I don't. I, obviously, I haven't got the feel of it yet, but. Uh, I know that they've been great friends for a long time, trading with each other. You have always also for been for many years, as much as long as I know you personally. I've done some tastings with you back in the Hotel Jakob. I used to work, and yeah. on other occasions, you've always been a great supporter for German wine. I used to be alone in the world, practically in my own country, mm. except with my great friend Jancis, Jancis Robinson. Uh, and we have been frustrated because we can't persuade people how great it is. No. But then for a long time it wasn't great. You have to admit that there were German wines went through a long valley of really depressing quality and everything else. Mm. Probably 20 years when it wasn't nearly good enough. Uh, but now, thank God, we're out of that. Mm. What, 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 where is the problem? When, what, is, is it our image or is it well, yeah, but why maybe would, Italians well, are better in um, displaying and marketing? Or? Yeah, but the image was destroyed when the wine was bad. It was as simple as that. Mm. You know, selling really cheap wine. Yeah. Nobody could pretend it was good. I mm. mean, we used to say, yeah, but German wine can be good. There are good producers. But where was the evidence? Mm. German wine used to be the first white wine in in England when I came into wine 50 something years ago. Mm. Every important dinner started with German wine. Mm. And sometimes you would have a French wine, in which case people said, oh yes, we've heard of Mosler, we've heard of Montmartre, but where's the Mosel, where's the Hock, as we called mm. wine, wine? I think uh, w we have done it quite an amount of work here and um, maybe we just say goodbye. I have one last question. Um, if you have an advice for, let's say, a young person finding his or her way in the wine world, what would be, what would be your advice to him? Because a lot of people ask me, oh, I'm interested in wine and I don't know how to get into it. No, a lot of people ask me and I don't have a good answer. <laughs> Be lucky. All right. So we're know, getting. What was the first quality that Napoleon demanded in his generals? Excuse me. What was the first quality that Napoleon demanded in in generals? Yeah. Luck. All right. <laughs> so this is a good this is a good closer. Um, Thank you, thank you, Hugh, for your time. It's and uh, looking forward now to our event. We're getting closer to uh, yeah. to the place. Um, uh, well, we're going to the hotel. Yes, yeah. but you can fresh up. And um, thanks for doing this unusual tasting in it the is car. Not unusual. We, did, we didn't taste anything in the car. Maybe that was. Um, well, it was Jonathan who told us that we are allowed. I, I, I didn't know that we were allowed to drink wine in the car. I wouldn't. But I wouldn't they, have they can't see my beer in the camera. It's okay. hidden down here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Next time. Alles klar. Thank you so much. And um, thank you. Hugh. Alles gut. Alles Gute. Ciao. Ja, also das war doch wirklich fantastisch. Also Hugh Johnson ist eine Legende. Ich muss sagen, es ist unglaublich charmant auch und vor allen Dingen so unglaublich wissend und ähm, behandelt das ganze Thema Wein auch mit einer Großzügigkeit, die man sich ja wirklich manchmal wünscht. Leute, ähm, wie gesagt, wer mit Wein anfängt, jetzt mache ich nochmal ein bisschen Werbung für ihn. Der kleine Johnson, damit ging es auch bei mir los. Tolles Buch, macht Spaß zu lesen. Klar hat man das Internet, klar hat man heute viele andere Medien, aber manchmal ist es auch ganz schön, klassisch und analog zu sein. Das ist ja genauso bei den Wein. Also in dem Sinn, mehr Spaß im Glas und äh, oh, jetzt geht's zur Probe. Neuen Weine mit Hugh heute Abend noch. Wow!